No. Okay, welcome to everyone who is logged in on the YouTube stream as well. So welcome everyone to a very special live collaboration with Virtuoso and Pirate Studios, an interactive DJ workshop here on the Virtuoso stage. I'm Michael Beardsley, your host for this evening. Uh, tonight we're going to cover the basic fundamentals of DJing from beat matching, cue points, rhythm and structure, blends, effects. There's probably going to be a few uh, unforeseen curveballs, I'm sure. Uh, we'll also be using um, Pioneer 2000's and 900 Nexus 2 mixer plus Serato software to demonstrate. If you don't know about us, Virtuoso is a powerful platform inspiring confidence for those who want to learn, create contemporary music, uh, delivered by some of the world's greatest artists in electronic music. We turn creators into artists. We have courses on our platforms from the likes of B-Traits, Carl Cox, Eats Everything, Flavor D, Hodge, Plastician, Shirelle, Shura, Swindle, as well as hosting music industry sessions here. Uh, with previous guests including Andy C, Becky Hill, Elijah, Fabric, UKF, plus many more. Pirate Studios is a worldwide network of DJ production, rehearsal, podcast and dance studios, giving you round-the-clock access to create and perform uh, with studios all over the UK and worldwide, 24-7 uh, round-the-clock access. So, on to tonight, grime and dubstep wouldn't be the same without the immense musical output of Plastician. Uh, the Croydon native has worked alongside producers such as Scream, Banger and artwork in the early 2000s. He held the longest running radio show on Rinse FM, as well as being the world's first DJ to have a specialist dubstep and grime radio show on national radio. It was with the 2008 release of his debut LP, Beg to Differ, on his Terror Rhythm Recordings label that Plastician first achieved widespread critical acclaim with an album still regarded as one of grime's best. Always want to keep things fresh. He's still working with some of the most exciting new MCs and rappers from around the UK. Without further ado, please, warm welcome for our guest tonight, Plastician. Hello, everyone. <laughs> nice to uh, be here. Uh, nice to see you all on the wall as well. This is, uh, this is an experience for me as well. I see some of you are outside as well. Look at the weather, <laughs> Laurie. Lovely. Um, yeah, thanks for coming and uh, hopefully we can all learn something today. Uh, if you're a DJ or, or if you're in interested in getting into DJing, then Hopefully we can cover as yeah. much as possible. Fantastic. So you've been a resident of Rinse FM, you've toured the world DJing, played the biggest festivals, played the biggest nightclubs. Uh, though before we get into the nuts and bolts of, of where to start for beginners, just a little bit about where did it start for you? Uh, what were the early days of DJing? What did they look like to you? So I guess for me, like my initial early days of DJing was an interest in pirate radio and just listening to uh, music that wasn't being played on commercial radio. So. For me, that was a UK garage in the very late '90s, early 2000s, um, and then like once I got into college, and you know, I wasn't actually didn't have a. I, I had an interest in music, but I think it, there wasn't really a passion for it. When I got into college and started listening more and more to this pirate radio, I had an interest in picking up some of these records, and then it was like, right, I, I want to learn how to mix records. I want to know how to DJ. I want, you know, and then you start learning how to mix. Once you know how to mix, then it's like, I want to be on the radio. I want to be in a club. I want to, you know, it goes from there. So I think that, that first sort of two, three years of my own journey was just getting good enough to like feel like I was confident enough to share my mixes with the kind of people that were booking DJs onto pirate radio stations um, and making contacts. Back then, you know, we were hanging out in record shops, meeting other DJs in like my locality that had a similar interest in terms of the music they were into. So that's how I met people like Scream, we mentioned, Benga. N-Type, Hatcher, uh, Artwork, they all kind of like frequented the same record shop that I did. And then like as I got more into like the grime side of things, I'd travel up to East London and hang out at Rhythm Division where I met people like Jammer, mm. uh, Slimzy, you know, uh, Footsie, cutting dub plates up in North London where I met people like Skepta and... So music house. Yeah, music house up there. So it's just, it, it, it kind of just was a natural move Con, like a very slow but gradual trying to like better like what like get next level next level next level so it was DJ and then it was learning to make beats because I the main reason I wanted to make beats was to try and get gigs because I noticed that a lot of DJs who also produce music were the ones that were getting 
booked mm. were the ones that were getting on the radio stations I was trying to get on. So that kind of pushed me into production. And even to this day, I still think that like most of my production is done because I want gigs that you know where people play that kind of music. So it's kind of like it, it all kind of folds into its back into itself. Yeah. For me. Okay, interesting. I don't think there's probably going to be quite a few people of varying ages here and watching on YouTube, but I'd be interested to know what your first pair of decks were. Do you start off on belt drive? Or? Yeah, yeah, I had belt drive, so for anyone who doesn't know the difference, I, Technics are the kind of like industry standard. If you ever seen like a turntable, it's a very heavyweight, very expensive bit of kit. But if you ever see a DJ playing on turntables in a club, on actual vinyl turntables, they're most likely going to be a set of Technics decks. They have like quite a heavy torque on them. They're really, you know, they're built like tanks, these things. Back in the day, when you're starting out, it's very expensive, to, and it still is very expensive to buy a setup of uh, Technics turntables. But you could get like belt drives. So a set of belt drives might set you back secondhand about 150 quid for like a pretty bad mixer and a couple of belt drive turntables. So that was where I learned my trade, just kind of like having a go. And now, you know, like in today's market, you have very affordable DJ controllers, which are really good at learning like the fundamentals of like, you know, beat matching listening for that first beat, knowing when something sounds like it's in or out in the mix, as well as all of the new technology that we have now around sync buttons, loop points, cue points, all these things that you didn't have when we were learning on vinyl. But I think that like, for me, learning the fundamentals on vinyl, just about like listening to beats, listening to patterns, yeah. those are things that you can take onto any kind of like hardware that you're using now. And I think that if you're learning to DJ, it's really good to learn how to kind of like spot the the things that you're trying to do by ear so, and then you yeah. know take it to the hardware interesting like what well, is we were talking and we're actually going to use a uh, track for this specific part really which was uh, which is a track that you identified as one that you or helped you learn the basics of rhythm and structure especially in a dj in context and that's dj zinc uh, 148 track so as if you were to explain to someone or explain it in the way that you would for the years experience that you've got what are beats what are bars and how does the zinc track how is the zinc track significant to this part for anyone who doesn't know this track this was like for me like one of the tracks that was really important at the time that i was really getting into something that i heard a lot of djs that i was listening to play it was a really like recognizable track in a lot of like garage dj sets at the time and for me, I, I kind of was self taught when it came to DJ and I was really intrigued to get into it. But I didn't have like a big brother or a cousin or a next door neighbor who could really show me how to do it. So even though I had the decks at home and I had been buying records, I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, and I think that when listening to this track, it really started to click for me because it, one thing like I think that anyone can kind of grasp is like getting two songs to sound at the same speed is kind of the very basic, the most like fundamental part of like getting a mix that that works but then the next level is like okay you know how to make two songs the same kind of bpm same tempo so you can mix them but if you don't mix them in the same sort of like time structure like patterns and beats then when the next track drops or when you kind of like no, in at the same time like it's not going to drop in at the same point as the last track that you were mixing would so i think this is where like listening to beats and patterns really comes into it and I wanted to use this track as an example because it has such um, recognizable um, patterns in it and like almost like a drum fill that comes at the end of all the patterns so even if you don't know the track you can recognize where these patterns come in and that kind of signals the end of uh, like a section of the beats if you like so we're talking about beats and bars Every beat is like quite, you know, you know what a beat sounds like. It's a, a beat, like a hit or a snare in time in, in, in the record. And then you've got these patterns. So in this record, we're going to have a quick listen of all of these patterns um, will start out in, in they, they kind of like fall into patterns of 16 bu uh, beats per pattern. Um, and then some people might refer to that as a bar. So like 16 beats per bar. And then everything kind of happens in like, in even numbers so you might hear like pat lumps of four patterns lumps of eight and and, and so on and so forth so what i do is i'll i'll get this track on mm. so we can have a listen of it and hopefully you can kind of like start to hear where these patterns there's kind of like a drum roll at the end of every 16 beat phrase and you'll hear that four times in each pattern so i'll play it from the intro so you can kind of get an idea of it Ooh. 
Can you hear that drum roll? That's the end of a 16 beat pattern. So if you hear all these 16 bar or 16 beat patterns, you'll hear that four times. You'll hear that drum roll at the end. That kind of signals to you that like you're coming to the end of a 16 beat loop. And as the tracks build, you can hear it's coming up, coming to the end of four patterns. When that end of that four patterns comes, that's when you want to start mixing your next track. That's when you want to release that next track because then when they do drop, They'll both drop at the beginning of a, like a phrase, if you like. So it means that when you're mixing, rather than just having a mix that sounds like it's in time, it's, gonna, it's actually going to drop. You know, like when you listen to DJs, as you all do, I'm sure, you know, that, that's why tr tracks both drop at the same time, or you can fade one out as one sort of coming down, the next one's coming up, and they both hit, and it just like makes a much cleaner mix. So listening to those patterns really key. The double drop. Exactly, when you like double, double drop something or, or you know, like just in terms of the track drops when it's supposed to drop instead of like in the middle of a phrase or like three beats in instead of like at the drop. So in tracks, a lot of electronic music, a lot of things are built in uh, even numbers. Yeah, I was going to say like on the subject of club tracks versus what well, we've got here on the, the club tracks, DJ friendly tracks, very sort of commonly for a 16 bars or phrases. But you were talking earlier about disco, like if we were going to go to different genres, how especially the original disco yes. tracks or other genres might be a little bit less DJ friendly. So how would you, how would you, how would you sort of work with that? So I think when you're playing like lots of other genres, if you're playing non-electronic stuff like disco, a lot of those records were, you know, like recorded in studios, played on live drums. So with like modern electronic music where it's built on a computer, everything kind of snaps right on beat at exactly the BPM that it was made at. Whereas a lot of disco might be, you know, played to a metronome or just not even played to a metronome, just kind of played live. So you will find that things don't sit or don't hit exactly the same, but also the structures were very different back then. So you might find like there's like a four beat Maybe there's parts where you just need a bit more space to mix together, like mm. vocal, too much vocals coming in. So when you're mixing stuff like disco, sometimes those mixes might be a little bit short, a little bit less, you know, like you, it's very difficult with some of that music to like create a, that long blend that you might get if you're playing like techno or drum and bass or something where it's sort of DJ in mind, you know. When disco was produced back in the like 60s and 70s, it was, they weren't thinking about how a DJ is going to play this. It was more like, we're going to perform this and this is how we're going to do it. And, um, so when you're playing that, you might find that some of the functions that you get on your hardware and software where you maybe like set up your tracks in like something like record box that you would use maybe before you get into the CDJs, maybe it's not catching those beats. That are some things that are built into these like bits of kit that you're going to be using, maybe things don't loop how you want or so you have to be a little bit careful, maybe do a little bit of prep before you play something that isn't straight up electronic music. I'd be interested to see uh, if anyone could just put in the chat room what genre, or multiple genres, but what genre is your forte? What do you mostly play or what are you looking to play? I'd just be interested to sort of get a quick. So we've got d we've got house, drum and bass, it's, it's hollow, jungle garage, funky house, EDM, techno d &B. Okay, so we've got a variety of DJ friendly genres, nothing too abstract. So there's a lot of garage heads in here, so a few <laughs> people must know that track, right? And then a couple of people nodding, yeah. <laughs> Some thumbs up there. Deep house, okay, cool. <laughs> Is that oh. a Heartless Crew t-shirt? Sorry, I've just seen Heartless on a t-shirt there. Is that, a, is that a proper garage head there? <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool, yeah. So, uh, has anyone got any questions actually? Um, for Denise, is that, uh, is that a question or is that just, uh, you got the hand, okay. <laughs> <laughs> has anyone got any questions so far at this moment? Hello, Mahay. Welcome to the room. Uh, okay. No, that's cool. Okay, so um, 
Yeah, I suppose we could just go into the next. Uh, just give us a quick tour of the decks and just cover. So I suppose we'll focus on uh, just the CDJs and the mixer as well, but just covering some of the, the basic fundamentals of what you would find on the vast majority of DJ gears in clubs and in pirate studios and anywhere really. So I suppose we'll start off with the most basic, most obvious, which is the play buttons. Yep, so obviously like you can see these things flashing here. Um, when you load in your USB, obviously your USB is going to go in there and then a lot of information is going to kind of load up. So up here is where you're going to like go through your folders and your playlists, anything that you've already set up in like Rekordbox, which is a free software that is made by Pioneer, which is designed to like ready your USB stick to kind of like be plugged in and you get a bit more of the functionality out of the songs. It can actually just play songs if you just load a folder into USB and plug it in. You can do it that way, but you might not get all of the kind of like the visualization. If you can see here, you, you can kind of see it like a, a, a preview of the waveform that gives you a rough idea if you like once you get more used to seeing these waveforms, you can kind of see where the breakdowns, the kind of build-ups, the drops are, where like the song goes quiet and then comes loud again, which can be quite useful, um, you know, like while you're mixing to see where some of those things are. So that's that's, that's kind of like the function there of like the screen. There's something, like a bit of equipment that like most controllers and stuff will have now as well. You'll see that in, in some part of the controller. So as much as like these things might all look slightly different, the functionality is quite the same. So straight away you've got this is your area here where you can kind of go through your USB or your CD, whatever you're using, uh, memory cards, to find the tracks that you're going to play. And that you use this jog wheel to kind of go through and then press the middle in when you want to select whatever it is that you're trying to find. You go into this, this is like a playlist of like house stuff um, that can come back out, go back to the front of it. You can go by album, by track. And that's the way that you kind of get around your USBs there if you've not used it before. That's very common across most things. And you have brought in Serata as well. We could quickly do a screen share just to show how you do the same, but within Serata. So if I just switch over to the screen share. So if we look at um, Serato as an example, we can see here, um, actually I'll get over here because I, I like this. This is <laughs> like my, this is my time. Uh, over here is like a little search bar. So in that corner, I can kind of search um, either within my crates, which are over here, these are like my, my crates on this section, um, and I create those as playlists. So they might be by genre, it might be by a gig that I'm doing or something. But I'll, I'll create those in my spare time, a selection of tracks that maybe I'll like, so example, I've got like a disco crate, I've got a, a 2022 crate, which is kind of like when I'm doing radio, all the stuff that I've downloaded recently, uh, 140 BPM if I'm playing like a grime dubstep gig. Most of the stuff that I need is in there, old and new. Um, there's one there, Ukraine. I was in the Ukraine just before Christmas. Um, I had a gig there that I knew was like, they're really into like breaks and garage and bass. And it was like, let me just throw a load of stuff in there and I can kind of play out of that, the gig. Because I don't pre-plan my sets. I like to have as much music of a certain kind of like to have a good range so that when I play, if something works, I'm like, let me play some more of that. If it doesn't, then I can move on and find something quick. So there's my crates. And you know, like, likewise um, on on here where you're kind of scrolling and pressing in, I can like just literally uh, come over here, kind of like if I type plastician in, I can find all of my own music that I've made. Maybe I like drag and drop onto the deck, uh, and that will load it into this deck. Now the difference between using Serato and your CD is, or USB, sorry. Serato kind of uses this control tone, which it just kind of, it's just like a literally like a tone. It sounds like a high pitch noise. And what that tells my computer is at what point of the record, if you like, I've dropped the needle. So it treats it almost like a digital record. I can move that to any part of the song. So if I hit like Q and I use it in what's called absolute mode, which is very similar to just using vinyl turntables. It doesn't really use any of the like tech that is available to us now. So for people like me who came from vinyl, it's like, that gets me to the first beat, which is all I need to know when I'm started out. But it also, if you look at the screen, it's got like the BPM here. That's the current BPM of the track. Plus 0.6% is, is the uh, speed at which it's at on the CDJ. And it won't be moving now, but if I start playing the track, it will start kind of like feeding that back in. So if I start playing this track, I'm gonna hit play. 
can see it kind of comes up to speed. So plus 1.2 percent. As I bring it faster, BPM goes up, and the percentage at which the BPM is playing is recognised. So if I slow that back down, you get a lot of that information on the CDJs as well. So if I was playing this on a, on a USB, where at the moment, as you can see, you might be able to see here, everything's set to zero. It doesn't pick up the BPM because it's a serato control tone as far as this is concerned. If you look at this CDJ, we have um, like the kind of classic USB setup there. And because it's been analyzed by record box, We've got the tempo here, 127 beats per minute, the plus 10. So you see here, it's like zero. That shows you here, like the plus 10 there, tells me that that is like my tempo range, because you can change the range of tempo available. This button here, you've got tempo plus six, plus 10, plus 16 and wide. And that is basically the range. So like that's a percentage of the initial. So if you imagine the original track was 100 beats per minute, then plus six would allow you to go all the way to the bottom, would take you to 106 beats per minute maximum. If you needed to go faster than that, you set it to 10. So plus six, plus 10 will get you to 110 beats per minute. Plus 16 would take you to 116. And wide, I think, let's see what wide goes to. I mean, wide goes like almost 100% on top, a bit more than that actually. I think it's like 120% or something. You don't really go as wide. Wide is crazy. If you like, if you play like wild music and you want to do some crazy stuff, then maybe you play wide. But I tend to, I tend to leave it at plus ten because it's most similar to uh, using classic vinyl turntables. So there's like your kind of basics. And like I said, I think Serato does a lot of what the CDJs do as well. It just kind of like shows you different. You know, you've got your BPM there, you've got your tempo range there. And this is the time from the beginning of the track, and that's the time to the end of the track. And these are things that you can see on the CDJ as well. If you look here, um, you can change the settings on it to show time modes. At the moment, it's set to show remain. That means that that time tells me how much time is left on the song, which for me personally is more useful than seeing how far into the song it is. Because if I'm DJing in a club, that tells me you've only got 30 seconds left. You need, you've got 30 seconds to mix the next track before you've got silence coming out of that deck. So for me personally, my, my advice is to use the remain rather than the start of it, because that information is going to be way more useful to you in a club, on the radio, or when you're you know, having a mix at home even. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the basics of like what you're looking at. Obviously, mm. you've got your play button here, which um, does exactly what it says on the tin. A bit of a crash course on the EQs and the trims. Yeah, so when we look at the mixer, we've got three channels here. On each, so we've got four channels, sorry, and on each uh, channel or input, we've got a, a low, a mid, and a high, and a trim. The trim basically sets what is the peak volume. So if you've got a track that is maybe not mastered, is a bit quieter than something that you're playing, you might use that trim to just give it a little extra boost. So like, again, in the terms of like the percentage of speed, that's almost like I want to get like an extra 10% of volume out of that track when it's at its maximum. Because when you're mixing, these are the kind of volume sliders here. And you're going to want them to hit the top. Like it's a little bit awkward if you've got everything kind of like mm. not quite at the top. So my advice would be, you know, when you want the track all the way in, it wants to be there. If one of your tracks is quiet, you want the trim, you want to use the trim to like make sure that that maximum peak volume kind of matches the track that's playing. So that's what your trims are for. The rest of it's kind of uh, self-explanatory. Uh, low frequencies, uh, mid frequencies, and high. So like, if you think of a track, low is going to be like your bass and your kick drums. Mid is going to be kind of where the vocals sit, um, and a lot of the riffs and a lot of the lead, lead sounds and synths. And highs is going to be like your hats, stuff like that. Now it doesn't, like, it doesn't target the hats. It's not like an algorithmic um, EQ. It's just going to do like that based on the frequency. So, if you are mixing two bass-heavy tracks together, maybe you want to like turn the bass down on the one that you're mixing out of, and slowly bring up the bass on the other one. Or sometimes you might find DJs that chop in and out, so like the bass line keeps switching between two tracks. You're going to jump like across one, like and switch between the two. So it's a very common thing, especially in house, DMV, jungle, garage, for the use of the low filter more, so the, yeah. the high and the mid. That's 
Exactly. If you're playing like bass heavy music, you're going to be using that lower mid a bit more. Um, if you're mixing vocal tracks together, that mid range can be quite useful if you've got like a short blend where there's not really any space in the track for vocals. So if you're playing like uh, dance hall, rap, hip hop, trap, drill, you might use that to kind of like mix out the vocal of the track that's playing before the next one comes in. So if you've got two vocal tracks going off at the same time, it can sound like a hot mess. Mm. And these are things that like, that's where the EQ comes in. Across here, you've got like effects as well, mm -hmm. yeah. which can really make your mix stand out like nicely. What's your favorite effect? My favorite effect is the reverb, just yeah. because I like, if I'm mixing kind of like melodic music together, the reverb's just nice to like put at the end of a mix. You can kind of give it a little tail off. Give us an example. Uh, I could give you an example, yeah. It's, uh, so if I like, I play this sort of like disco housey record. And if I get another one, go back into the same USB. I've noticed a few questions in the chat box. I'll come to those in a moment. Uh, Monique, I know that you've asked one. So I'll give an example of like how I'd use the reverb. So um, I can see this track is at like 150. Before I even try and mix one, I'm going to bring this down so that it hits 156. Both been like put through record box, so the temperature should be roughly what I want them to be. I'm gonna turn my booth monitor up here. As well. Booth monitor is the volume of the speaker that is usually in the DJ with you. So you can only turn that up or down to your own taste. I hear into the full club, an old DJ, and I have it quite loud. Q <laughs> um, buttons tell you what's gonna come into your headphones. So you tend to want the song that's not playing to come in here, and then you're gonna try and like find the volume. Put your volume here for your headphones. Got a little bit of a dust just, in my Just on the headphones cut as well, because there is an option where you can bleed or blend a little bit of... Yeah, so what... the Q and master here is going to give you the mix between just hearing the track in your headphones and hearing a bit of the master volume as well. You've got that on. at the end of that pattern. Start mixing in a minute. I'm gonna bring the bass out of that as I bring it up. I'm gonna use what's called the top filter over here. I'm going to turn that up. Give me. So I'm going to turn the reverb up a touch now. You might have heard a little bit of the reverb, you might not have, but I think it's one of these things where like, even if it's not, it's quite subtle, but like that reverb just gives a nice kind of smooth finish on what might be like quite a harsh cut otherwise. Just kind of help blend the whole mix together. Because if I mix back the other way without that, you might hear like the harshness of it. I'll wait for the pattern to come back round now. I'm gonna hit the Q button, there's like a... I can feel the beat coming in, you wanna like... hear the vocals coming in, and kind of, kind of like bring us into... four spot, and start mixing them. Some people in the chat as well saying what their favourite effects are. 
spiral, plunger for life. Get the spiral rolls in this one. Spiral roll and reverb for sure. I love Echo. So you can cut the mix as well, so you've got the two tracks in, you might... You feel like the mix is going out or something needs to be, you can kind of nudge the deck as well. Like you'll use the side of like maybe uh, slow it down, speed it up a bit with your thumb, but push it in. I'll show you how you can kind of adjust the, the torque of that. You'll hear what the mix sounds like without the reverb now, it's going to be a little bit more harsh. For me, like that reverb just kind of like just cleans the mix up a little bit, a tiny little bit of that effect to help bring that transition. Like, it feels a little bit that's a personal preference, though. Like, a lot of people, a lot of people are like quite happy to just like cut it like they prefer it to sound that way. These are things that all come down to like your own personal preference and style. Maybe, maybe it's not to do with the music that you're playing as well, if it's like bass heavy. Maybe you don't need that blend, that, that reverb effect. If it's a bit more like uh, musical and you're kind of mixing in key, like those are reverbs can like help everything kind of float nicely. If you play stuff like ambient music or you know like minimal techno, like that reverb can be really nice to like, make everything feel like it's all part of the same mix. Like. Um, just to get back into what I was talking about there um, on the kind of like effects. There's two modes on the CDJs as well. You have the vinyl mode and the CDJ mode, which, um, you know, like for me, as someone coming from vinyl, I just kind of like always use vinyl mode. The CDJ mode is a little bit more if like you're going to hit the cues and the buttons and stuff like that. But the main difference between the two is if I touch the top of the deck on vinyl mode, it's going to stop it like a deck of I can like scratch it and rewind it and find the beat. If I put it in CDJ mode, it's going to have the same effect that I showed where I was touching the side. If I touch the top, it's just going to slow it down. It won't stop the record like a vinyl. So like, if you are not someone who kind of like wants to scratch or wants to do it, maybe you use the CDJ mode and you just kind of nudge, but it's a little bit more harsh as you can hear. What would be the benefits of using CD mode over vinyl mode in that instance? I think question that is one of them okay <laughs> hitting a pause on it won't like stop the record like if i hit pause on vinyl it's pause and you can just the slow down speed with them as well back in there whereas like the cdj is a bit more like there's some different functionalities in it like that but um another thing another thing to touch on actually on this is like you can you can adjust like how sensitive you want that to be so if you need to slow you feel like someone who's going to touch the decks a lot to like find that speed until you're happy with it you've got like this jog adjust which like makes the deck the platter even more heavier or really um like in in terms of like grime dj and a lot of grime djs that you'll play back to back with they'll turn this jog adjust all the way down and i'll show you exactly why they would do that right if i hit jog adjust in vinyl mode and do a spin back or a reload listen to the difference if i have it on heavy as opposed to light. So a lot of grime DJs like to have it light because they'll put a reload in there and it will do it will sound like that. Whereas if I did that with a heavy on, let me just get like fast into the track again. On heavy mode, I'm just gonna like forward that into like a beefier part of the track. On heavy mode if I do the same thing it's not gonna like spin as lightly. Mm. Heavy versus light. So Plus like, everyone. it depending on how much you think you're going to touch the plow. Me personally, I like to have that at about three o'clock, around that there. I like it because it feels that that's a bit more similar to the talk that I was used to when I was 
practicing like vinyl back in the day. And I think that for me, that's the happy medium. But again, these are all like personal preferences. These are just things you can do to like age your own style of mixing mm. a bit more. Cool. Uh, we had a couple of questions which uh, have gone up on the screen. I do know that there was a question from someone asking you, where do you get your music? If you're not being sent music, which I can imagine is uh, a lot of the music that you do play, where would you go? Would you use Bandcamp? Where would you, where? Yeah, uh, for me personally, like I'll use SoundCloud to kind of like discover. I find that for me, following a lot of artists on there, seeing what they're reposting on there, I can find artists that I've never heard of before. Um, and if, if they're clued up most of the time, they'll link you to like a Bandcamp where you can download and buy the music that they're kind of posting on SoundCloud. So I'd say like, Majority of my music, I'll probably discover on SoundCloud and then buy it on Bandcamp. Um, the reason I buy it on Bandcamp is that goes directly to the artist, as opposed to like to a distributor, to iTunes. To you know, if you if you buy a track on iTunes, the artist's not going to see like their distributor will see the money about three months later, and the artist will see it another month after that. So it could take like four months for the artist to get about sixty to seventy percent of what you pay, versus Bandcamp, they'll get it within a couple of minutes of you buying it mm. and like at maximum is about 10% that they'll lose so yeah if you're buying music from artists who are like on the come up or starting out Bandcamp if they've got it is definitely the best way to support them okay uh, Monique I think it was a question from yourself how do you mix on CDs is, is that the question it's gone did you mean like li literal CDs or on CDJs what was that oh, on the CD with CDs so yeah, pretty okay. much exactly the same, um, except you, instead of putting a USB in here, you burn your music onto a CD, and then there's a CD slot uh, just at the front of the CDJ. When you load that in, you're just gonna be using um, the track search. So down here, you've got like your, your back and front. If I remember rightly, it's been a while since I personally used a CD, but I'm pretty sure you go through the tracks using that. You're pretty much just gonna be using this section here. Like, that's like your fast forward and rewind that's next track, and then your cue is gonna like take the first second of that CD track. So if there is a beat at the front of it, which most people bounce the music out of electronic, you know, like a door, or like a Fruity Loops, or FL Studio, or Cubase, et cetera, that's gonna have a beat right on the cue point. Um, but yeah, you press play, and this would pretty much be, be all you need there in terms of CDs. I, I don't think you're gonna get the waveform. Um, I might be wrong, like, it's been such a long time since I use CDs. But um, I'm not sure if the waveform will show up. That might be something I'd need to look into. But yeah, CDs do work on pretty much the same. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the question, Willie. Um, there was a question on beat matching. We are going to come on to beat matching uh, later on in the session. Um, so yeah, who asked that? If you can hang fire that and re-ask that in the chucks, it's, it's gone on my screen. <laughs> but Claudia, quickly, and then Daniel, what do you think of Beatport? Yeah, Beatport's good. Um, they offer like a pretty decent royalty rate for artists. Um, you know, like in terms of the kind of music, if you're if you're if you're a tech house producer or you're into sort of like more like accessible versions of electronic music that may be a little bit less niche. If you're like if you're playing in like a if you're playing in a busy club in a town on a weekend, for example, and you need like the hits that everyone's after, Beatport's great for finding like what are the kind of trending songs in specific genres. So if you're if you DJ in like in a in a in like a local town where you know it's busy, people go out for a drink, they want to hear all the songs that are on the radio, Beatport is really good for finding what those songs are, making sure that you've got them. Um, and in terms of yeah, I mean it costs a little bit more money on Beatport, but the artists are probably seeing roughly the same. And uh, yeah, my experience of working with Beatport is that they're pretty like pretty supportive of the artists. They've got good curation, and yeah, I, I think they I think they're good. Okay, cool. Uh, we'll move on to cue points and everything around that subject. So, uh, what is a cue point for for anyone who is in the room or watching on YouTube? What is a cue point if they don't know? So, a cue point is like a point in the track which uh, you can set or can be preset for you. Um, where you might want to start the mix from. So for me, I don't really use cue points personally, but my, so my cue points are always, or what, my, what I would put a cue point on would always be the first beat in that song. Um, there might be instances where you've got a song where it has like an odd number of patterns maybe, it's only got three patterns as opposed to like two patterns and you want to mix so that everything drops nicely so you maybe don't, you don't want to mix out of that first uh, 16 beats. 
So you might want to start like the cue point slightly further into the track. Um, in terms of like looking at th those, yeah. in, for, my, for me personally, that's where I bought my cue point, right at the very first set. And the reason that the, what you do with a cue point is uh, it means that when you've set one, this cue button will will kind of like initiate play, or at least like in, and if you use the cue button and hold it down, it will start playing, and then you let go of it, it goes straight back to that cue point. So the cue point is set on like the part of the song that you want to start mixing, and depending on what you know you want to do, if you play, if you play dancehall, rap, hip hop, you might want that cue point to literally be like eight beats before the chorus kicks in or something like that. A lot of hip hop DJs will put a cue point literally right before the first chorus or the first verse so mm. that when they're mixing in the club, it's like five beats or not five, that's a bad example, four or eight beats and then they just whack it in and it's like bang, the next song's in and they can quickly mix. Um, if you're playing electronic music and it's got a longer intro, your cue point is most likely going to be the very first beat and that is what like it's probably why for me I don't really have cue points set on my tracks because it's always really the first beat the kind of music that I play but like I said you could set a cue point somewhere in like you kind of let it come in and decide that you want a cue from so like I just hit cue there and it's Actually, got me out to the beginning again. That was a bad example, wasn't it? But uh, there was a loop function that we were showing when we were before yeah, you, the session. So on here, there's like a loop mode. I don't know if you can see here, but this sort of top corner of the touch touch screen is a loop mode. And um, if we start playing here into like a loop mode, we've got like quarter, half, one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. And if you've already set your music in record box, it will kind of like it will find the beat and it will loop from that point as many beats as there like are. So I'll give you an example of like a four beat loop. I'm going to hit four there. Because I've got quantized turn on, this is important as well. If you haven't got quantized turn on, that will loop from wherever you touch it. So if your loop, if your tracks are not um, kind of preset in record box and have been set properly to the BPMs, and you might end up with a really wonky loop. Or if you're playing disco, as we mentioned, mm -hmm. if it's not really locked in, that loop's probably this function is not really going to be that useful. If you're playing electronic music and you've got that quantize on, it's going to loop from the next beat, the next downbeat, the next kick drum. So we've got a four beat loop going off there. I can half it. I can half it again. Half it again. And then I can come out of the loop by hitting the exit. So that can be really uh, useful if you're going to like I do some really dramatic mixing again. This is like probably a little bit more of an advance once you get really used to what you're doing and turntable isn't it? You might be like, yeah, I'm gonna start messing with that. Uh, but yeah, that is one of the functions there. You've got other things like beat jump, which is something that like I see people use. It's not something that I personally use, but, um, but yeah, there's a lot of lot of functions in here that you can explore and kind of like get get to grips with and get used to. I think like more build your confidence around the piece of kit that you're working with, whether that's a controller or turntables here or you know, Serato has a lot of built-in effects and loops and lots of things that, you know, like even, even me as someone who's been using Serato for years, I'll bring a new version out, it'll be something else you can do on it. And look how you do it on Serato. So on Serato, if I like load up a, if we can give an example on that same track, like one of my old tracks, um, I'm going to switch back to Serato mode here. Just go into my folder, find that control CD. So if I play this track, um, now the thing about Serato is the way that I use it, I don't have like cue points. A lot of this thing, a lot of this is just kind of like it, it will read the same way that something like record box will, and it will set the BPM. And that's kind of how I use Serato, just like a basic record box, but still kind of mix a bit like as if I was using vinyl. So you can use a loop function, but it's a lot more manual. It does have the opportunity to do similarly, but I'll show you how manual works and how, and you'll see like the difference because the loop won't be like perfect. Whereas if I hit one of the manual ones, if you've got your time structures set, it should loop nicely. So I'll give you an example. So in Serato, I'm gonna go into what's called relative mode instead of absolute. Absolute is a bit similar to like vinyl mode on a CDJ. When I go into relative mode, I can start to access all of the functions of loops and cue points. 
down here, full screen here. Similarly to the CDJ, I've got like eight, an eighth of a beat, a quarter, or a half, one, two, four, eight, sixteen. And you can even go further than that if you press this side button there, you've got like 32. So if I want to create like a like two beats, and then I click it again, it comes out of it. If I wanted to do it manually though, you can go into this like loop mode here. And then it similarly has got like in and out. If you start messing about with them mid mix, it can get really messy. But what you can do is like hit this loop button here. And then you start it by going clicking in. Oh, that's not the right one. So if I click in here, it's going to start a loop. And then I click out. And that sounds like a quite a good loop actually. But you can get it wrong. And I'll show you what it sounds like if you get it slightly <laughs> off. So if I come out of the loop, if I try and do that again, but do it wonky, you'll hear, hear how bad it sounds. It's like, it's out. You know, if you start getting a bit, I mean, some people are great at that. I think that's another thing that you might get better at it with time, like just doing it manually. But uh, again, this is all practice and there's lots of ways you can loop and mess about, add cue points. There's lots of stuff you can do in Serato. Like I said, I'm a very basic user of it. I, it works for me in the sense that it is a great tool for carrying like tens of thousands of songs into a DJ set. Mm. And I, that's kind of how I use it. But there is like tons of functionality in there that you can really get into. Cool. We've had an interesting request actually from Alexand Alexandra. I would love to see examples of mixing from different genres and how beat matching works there. That's a, that's a good point, and which takes us into um, the next section, which is beat matching. So I suppose before we get into that, I mean, is that something you can show us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's no different. You can mix the same genres, different genres. So long as the BPMs are the same, you can mix any two songs together. And even if like the BPMs are like divisible by each other. So if you've got like 128 beats per minute, you could mix that with a 64. Um, and, and like, you, you know, you could double time it, you could half time it. That can sound a bit weird, but it is definitely doable. Um, I'll try and get an example together. Um, so it's just whilst you're doing it, for anyone again, who is just a little bit unfamiliar with the terminology, who's on the wall, who's watching on YouTube, what, what, what is beat, how would you describe beat matching? So beat matching is basically getting the two songs at the same tempo. So like how many beats per minute? So. We've talked about that here, like that, that housey record that we played was like 126 beats per minute. Um, so like this is where maybe like it gets difficult if you're trying to mix like a hip hop record that's like 90 beats per minute with something that's like 120. It's really difficult to do that without making it sound ridiculous. Like you can do it, but you're going to have to turn the tempo up of the hip hop record or turn the tempo right down of the dance record. So so long as you're roughly 10, like if you think about the, again, the kind of the tempo wheel, and we take that, if we go all the way down and that's like 10%, basically you want, you can mix anything together so long as it's roughly 10% within each other. Okay. So I'll try and like get a couple of tracks together as like an example. Yeah, sure. Um, before, it, before it disappears, because Johan, you did actually ask a question earlier on, uh, which is related to this. My question from earlier, how do you beat match the waveforms when you have two separate screens? Are you Serato today? Uh, which has the waveform side by side on my laptop, which of course is easier. Do you have any tips and tricks? So I would say, like me personally, like I mix, I can mix by ear, so I don't need waveforms or screens to mix. As long as I can hear that they're both at the same time, I, I can use my ears. Um, the waveforms are great for like a bit of feedback. So it's very rare that I would use both. Or I just wanted to set them both up so that we could kind of show the differences and how like you can still use the same kind of ideas across whatever like equipment that you want to use um, but I could I could like mix one deck on Serato and one deck on this um, for me my ears are my main sort of source of feedback because I can hear if the tracks are in or out whether I know what the BPMs are or not it's great to know what the BPMs are before I start mixing because I'll know just looking those two records can or can't be mixed together because of the speeds that they're produced at that's kind of all I need to know then it, a lot of it's done by ear you know, like I'll nudge stuff rather than like, you know, we do have technology here that allows us to sync 
which I can show you a bit more about as well. If you've got your stuff like sort of preset in um, record box, you can use those sync modes and that will like lock everything in. Um, but yeah, I use my ears. So I, I try and like hear if something's in, if something needs to be slowed down, I might give it a little nudge backwards. If something needs to be sped up, I might nudge it forwards and bring that tempo down until I'm like, yeah, they sound like they're locked in and then I can start getting a bit more creative with the mixing. Um, I'm gonna try and find like a couple of yeah. tracks that are not like the same genre, but like a, a jungle track and a sort of 120. Maybe like get like a disco record and something. I'm trying to find something that's maybe like a a. Let me think. Where is a what's that? Like, like a we can maybe like a tune. one like a, a 90 B, BPM and then like a DMV record or something like that and see if we can get that going. Uh, maybe like create a loop. I, I don't have a great deal of DMV in my crates, believe it or not. But uh, you were playing a jungle tune earlier. I, I was playing. I'm going to try and find that. I must have something that I can mix to sort of give an example. But I've got like a. So if I go right to the top here. Um, I'm trying to find that. I picked the worst potential there, haven't I? Like, I need to almost go slower than that to like do this because my t my tempo is only going up to like one seven five at the most there. Another thing as well is like, I'm looking at like my BPMs here, and I know that some of the uh, songs that are in the sort of like slower are just like not um, they haven't been read correctly by Serato. It thinks they're like eighty BPM, but they're actually uh. like one forty. Um, maybe I'll do it with something a bit easier. In terms of like two different genres, so if I, mi I mix like disco, I'll start out at like 100 beats per minute and slowly build up. It's a lot easier to like gradually do it than like really, but I'll try and find an example. Maybe we just make something that sounds a bit crazy. Um, what have we got here? I suppose that answers the question from Arimas. Is it fair to say that by mixing you are quite dependent on the style uh, and similar tempos between tracks? What would be the range you think is still doable and sounding good? I guess you... I think it depends on how long you're playing because you could start off really slow and end on DMB, but you might need like six hours to like gradually get build up. Whereas if you like start slow and start and finish on DMB, you're, every song you're going to be like, you're going to be pushing the tempo up like almost 10% every track you play. Mm. And like a track played 10% faster, you'd be surprised that like, I was going to play this Carly Simon record. Hopefully it doesn't get us booted off of, uh, <laughs> off of uh, YouTube. But um, let me just quickly try and like give you an example of like what you know like how crazy it will sound if you mm. start speeding stuff up and um, i've got to get the serato tone again i'm on the wrong usb link so i'm going to, I'm going to do this all in serato because let's get serato to... on just so Clouds look warm. You can already hear how slow it sounds. So like these are the extent you have to go to to really push like that. Maybe I create a loop. Actually, let's try and just mix. I'm going to find a track that's about 160 beats per minute um, and see if we can mix that while this is at 80. 80 to 160 should work. Um, see if I've got anything that wants to It's going out of like this way. So I can also see the uh, key. That Craig David record is not going to be there. Uh, Ivy Lab is going to be like drum beat. Let's try this. So if I mix this, you'll hear like jungle mixed in. It will work.
it's more it's like hearing it in double time. There's literally no beats in the intro of this song either. It's gonna be fun. So I'm gonna cut the bass out because the drums are a bit wonky on it. Very wonky beats, I feel love. That was wonky, that was really wonky. I was hoping it was going to be like a jungle track, but uh, it, it wasn't like a song. Like, yeah. If you kind of like see on the screen, like this, uh, this sort of marker here is like shows you where the track is. When you're DJing on Serato, you can kind of see that these, like, you get used to these waveforms in the air. So anything red is kind of like the face, anything green or blue is like your hands. So if you're ever like having this distance, it's useful to like seeing where those kind of things are going to match up, like having a different thing You'll use your eyes a little bit more. It's all down to what you use that and see it. So you need to wait for it. And that mix there, you can just like, because this is twice the speed of that. Like the, if we have a drum with it and every other screw with it. Yeah, that's just trying to work. Can you, uh, just got a good question here actually. Uh, can you give us an example of how to mix with, without beat matching, e.g., uh, for example, using effects to transition between two songs with different tempos. We've also had a few uh, asks about, yeah, I suppose just turn the booth down when we have it, because I think it's bleeding into the yeah, microphone. Yeah. But yeah. Um, but yeah. So in terms of like mixing without mixing, like just using the effects, I guess any, you know, you don't have, that doesn't matter, right? You just literally want to use the effects to st like fade out of one thing into another in like the cleanest way possible. So if I just like, I'll put a couple of my tracks in and just, um, just show you like what that might sound like sure. or how you might do that um you can do that with like beat effects and stuff like that to kind of give you a bit of a nice a nice effect um let's just go into that so if i just start playing this one if i come over to the effects over here one of the cool things you can do is like these beat effects so like you can make like an echo effect that's all the same time with the track. Um, so if I'm going to fade out and just play the next one, I just want to make sure that this song is right at the beginning of the track. So on Strato, I'm going to go back into like absolute mode. But if you're using a CDJ, you're just going to go like right to the back of the track. So that I'm going to use like the beginning of If I want to do like a beat effect on this, you can either like press the auto and it will try and sort of find the reverb. Um, so you see here, so find their beat, sorry, not the reverb, it says reverb, it's over there. So I'm going to set the uh, the effects channel to 2 because that's the channel that we're that we're playing on now. And then I'm going to select um, echo. Echo will go in beat. You can see here it's like flashing on a quarter beat. Okay. So I'll go to like four beats. And then I'm going to bring this down. This is like the kind of the volume of that effect. So I'm going to say you bring that up, and then we can kind of maybe we'll do like a little reload like effect and then I'll fade this one up, hit play. So I'm going to use the filter over here so something else that I can't hide. So you don't have too much bass effect. You need like that echo effect now. 
bring this one up, and maybe I'll just hit play on it. So that's interesting. And then you can turn the volume down on that echo as it's still going. So that might be useful if you do like a radio show. You might not get away with that in a club, but in a radio setting or, you know, even if you're just like putting a mix together for someone or maybe you're playing vocal tracks and you don't want to like try and attempt a proper mix, but you just want to like blend it out. You can use that. You can use the reverb effects. You can bring like that kind of beat effect back down. I'll show you how like the difference of So you have the one beat instead of four beats, it's a lot shorter. And you, you can really like, you can go wild with that as well, like this pad down here. You can change the sort of tempo of it so it's more in beat as well, so you just fiddle around with that. And then I might just play this one from the edge. So yeah, that's probably how you mix. If you're not trying to beat match, you can just kind of like fade it out that way. Okay. Um, okay, so we've just got a question into it here from Denise. More on the back of Angelica's question. Mixing 140 into an 80 BPM uh, liquid BPM, would you say best thing to do is an echo drop on the song to transition? It's not something I would attempt, personally. Um, it's too... The difference between those is too wide that like you'd have to bring that 80 BPM track down to like 70 BPM maybe or you'd have to speed the 141 up to 160 and uh, both of those are a little bit too big a deviation from what they should sound like. Like with that Carly Simon record it's like way too slow. To mix 140 into like, like this is 140, for me to mix a one like for me to mix 80 BPM into this, this is what it would have to sound like. Um, it'd have to sound like even slower than that, to be honest. There's 80, so that's how it's slow, or you have to go the complete other way and go 160. like too big a deviation so you just if you wanted to mix one like 80 bpm into 140 i'd suggest that like, you just do it gradually so like maybe you bring the tempo down from one track to the other so like maybe we're playing at 140 now i might bring it down to like 136 mix a track in that's like 136 then slow that one down to 132 mix that one into one, 132 slow that down to 128 and then gradually, like you maybe lose like four beats per minute over time. It might take you about 20 minutes to get down to like that 80 BPM or up to it if you wanted to get faster and play 160 or it's just like that. So unless you literally wanted to go stop, start, there's no like clean way of mixing those that would, and without getting really technical into it, I think, right? Then you could probably start mixing in like triplets and stuff like that if you really wanted it's literally like mathematics. You can you can figure it out, but I guess it's one of the things that like you'd have to just practice. Sometimes I'll whack like an instrumental on, make it super fast, but then I'll play like an a cappella at half time over it mm. just to see. I've, I've never attempted it in a club, but at home, it's these are things you can kind of have fun with. Get away with as well. See if you can get away with it, and then if you get if you start remembering these things, then when you're in the club, you might be like, I know how to do that, and like bang, you whack that down. Like when I was started out, the classic one was like playing on vinyl, yep. playing a drum and bass record, but playing hitting it on 33 instead of 45. Ah. So it's like slows it right down. You mix a garage record in with Pop it and, and be bass. like, oh wow, what happened to that? But that was about as technical as you could get back then. Now you could really go wild, but yeah, I would say that unless you're really like clued up on how you did how you do that, yep. it's really difficult to do that without just sounding like wow, that that was too harsh. Just um, just a quick one on or any advice, because uh, it's happened to me sometimes um, in the club especially, which is very embarrassing, how to avoid and salvage the train wreck. Any sort of tips Ooh. on when it does go horribly it, wrong, which, is, which will happen to the best of us, I'm sure. It does happen sometimes. And when it happens, my advice normally would be don't try and wrestle with it. it, it once it's gone, let it go. Like Use that reverb effect. Get rid of the last record. 
and just kind of like pretend it never happened. Like have a sip of your drink, <laughs> talk to your mates and then get back to it. <laughs> like it does happen. Like there's no escaping it. Sometimes it will happen. If you try and wrestle with it, it will last two minutes and it will be absolute hell. It'll be like a brick in a bathtub as was the saying used to go. Spin it out. Yeah, DJ yeah spin it out, yeah. a bit of reverb if you're <laughs> clever enough, but don't try and wrestle with it. It can, it, it can be a bit of a, a challenge. Okay, just uh, one last bit before we open the floor to some more questions and then we're also going to be treated to a mini mix as well from Plastician. Um, blends and effects, one phrase blends. So, is, yeah, I guess like, we, we were discussing this off camera, like yeah. one phrase blend, I guess, like I would say is like the example that we gave at the beginning of 138 trick, that kind of four patterns. I'd maybe say that's a phrase. So in terms of like mixing, uh, like an example of that, maybe like I'll put a couple of my old tracks on. Um, it's actually terminology there, yeah. Yeah, we can. I think you can. You can kind of interpret that, however. But for me, like I'd say, like a phrase is almost like a set of patterns that makes like that part of the song. So it might be that first, that first sort of loop, that first few loops in the original part of the song, or it might be the chorus. It might be the breakdown, depending on like how long they are and how long the intro of the track you're trying to build it into maybe but i'd say like for me most of my like phrases might be like 16 or 32 bars mm. um so i'll give you an example i think this will probably be 16 so i'll start the same track that we were just playing um so if i get that to like 140 and play that and then i'll start mixing this one in get another track at 140 and we'll do like a 16 bar blend if you like I'm just gonna find something that sound okay. This should be in key. I'm going to mix for like a pattern here. So I basically just blended the two together for like four patterns there. A phrase if you like. And I'd say that like when you're going to mix like that, you want to you want to end like your mix in an even number of beats again. So like it might be like an eight bar, or a sixteen bar at the end. Like I might have like if I wanted to continue that mix, maybe I'd drop it out now before it drops into the next part. So yeah, sometimes like it's good to hold a blend long. Sometimes songs don't need to be held for a long time. You know, you've got a big chorus coming. Maybe just let the mix come in. Again, these are all things like down to preference, down to style, and to what two tracks you're mixing as well. So, yeah. so like, there's no right or wrong way, like how long you should be doing it. It's all about what feels good when you're in the mix. It sounds great and it, it's like you can ask for, maybe let it ride a bit. If it's not, let that song drop, mm. it's one queued up. Cool. We, we, you touched on this earlier, but yeah, any any more sort of tips using EQ, uh, EQ, EQ <laughs> with blends? Like any, any sort of more tips on Anything that we didn't really touch on earlier. I think in terms of like using the effects, uh, you can get so technical with it. I think yeah. it's down to like personal preference and ability and practice as well. You know, me like I'm much more comfortable messing around with the EQs across two tracks. I'm on the bass, and that maybe like I'll use the filter a little bit towards the end. Like I really like those. The color effects. Yeah, the color yeah. effects are really nice. Okay. As like an in, in, in alternative. Sweet the space is like and you can turn them down. It's just like very similar to what you've got over here, but like a lot easier to mess about with without like getting everything in beat and that like even just like cutting the bass out. You can mess about with an EQ.
trying to do it in time. That's why if you ever see DJs like messing around like that, I always get told off for it. I get like loads of comments like, what's he doing? Like, it's habit. I <laughs> start mixing and like moving about. I don't know. It's one of the things that if you're enjoying yourself, right? <laughs> quite exclusive to because uh, one thing that I um, am guilty for is combining EQ with the flanger and the phaser. Yeah, so, like, you we, can do that as well. Like, I mean, so give us an example of that. We get perhaps. into we'll use the same track, so like a good reference point now. Um, let's just get that back to the beginning. It's in relative mode, so like my none of my buttons are working. There we go. So the flanger effect. If I put it on two, that makes sure that it's Phaser effects. Got like pitch effects. Spiral, something like a beat effect. Delay effects. Yeah, you can get really creative with it, mess about. You, yeah, you can have some fun. Once you kind of get to grips with a lot of this stuff, and like the more you get to practice, the time you can spend, the better you'll get, and the more comfortable and confident you'll get doing it as well. Sometimes, like, it's easy to think, oh, you, when you DJ, you need to be doing all that. You don't have to, but if it, if it feels good and, like, you know you can pull it off and you're not overdoing it, it can be, like, really good to add, like, a bit of something to the mix. We did uh, touch on it very briefly earlier in terms of, we just, we just said what it was, but the double drop, we said that earlier it's when two tracks um, drop at the same time. Could you, is it too much to ask to give us an example of a double drop? Is that some... I could probably do that, yeah. Like, if I play this track now, see if I can get one lined up really quick. So that's just basically like, I know these tracks inside out because I've produced them myself. So I knew that, that that track has like a kind of a drop and a breakdown. So there's a 16 bar pattern, which is kind of like there were basses, and then there's an eight bar pattern where the bass kicks out and then it kind of loops back around again. So I knew that if I mix that halfway between that 16 bar pattern, this has a 16 bar intro. So by kind of computing that in my head, I know mixing halfway through that kind of bass pattern, this track's gonna drop when the bass kicks in again on at the end of that pattern where the bass drops out. So these are things that the double drops kind of like, you know how to compute in your head as you know like, this song has a 32 bar intro, that song's next drop is gonna be in 32 bars, that is when I'm gonna hit mix, start the mix, you know that those two are gonna drop at the same time again. So that's kind of like how, again, like, this is where like come in to know your tracks, it really comes in handy. It's difficult yeah. to do something like that with new songs that you maybe don't know as well. But once you get to know those songs and get used to them, you know 16 bars for the next drop, get the next tune in if you've got 16 bar intro, or you put your cue points every eight, eight bars before the drop, maybe you just mix that last eight. Yeah. Not to know your tunes yeah. is one of the key 
Um, Mark, uh, before the question disappears in the chat box, how do you stop yourself getting excited and <laughs> mixing a new track in after only a minute or so? What do you do while you are standing there waiting? Okay. Have, have a drink <laughs> sometimes. No, it's a, it, do you know what? When I was young and starting out, a lot of the music that I play is quite repetitive as well. So like, it's actually suited to like quick mixing, like, like music we listen to here, like the early grime stuff I was playing and making when I started out. It's quite basic loop based. Not a lot happens in it unless you've got vocals on top of it or there's an MC on the set or something like that. So like, quick mixing was a thing. So I was constantly like mixing. I didn't really have a drink while I was DJing back then. You know, if I'm playing like a disco set, if I'm playing something a little bit more, you know, longer mixes, longer tracks, where a song might be playing for five minutes. Yeah, I might have a, a drink. Uh, but yeah, I think that's what he's saying, like talking about all this stuff that I'm doing. Maybe that's just like me trying to like not have weird eye contact with people in the crowd. And it's like trying to keep your eye on what you're doing and like keep engaged with it without like, not knowing where to look. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. is a bit, it does get a bit like that. But yeah, I guess it's just like something you naturally end up doing, having a drink, looking for the next track. Like there's quite a lot. You'll be surprised how much there is to do unless you get to the point where like you pre-plan your set and you know your set inside out and you know what you're going to play at that gig. And it's like, well, you know, like I know this song, I've got five minutes to mess about because it's the next track on the USB. It's loaded in. Yeah, yeah. I can kind of mess about, have a chat to the promoter, get a drink. Uh, give my mate their backstage passes, like, <laughs> and then mix the next track. But yeah, it, it's not always like that. Okay, uh, cool. So um, yeah, we're gonna very soon go into your uh, ten-minute mini mix, uh, and then we'll close out the session. But before we do, we're gonna do that in two minutes. Um, has anyone got any questions for Plastician before uh, we conclude the session? We've had some good questions up to this point as well. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, for... really good questions. Dushan, you've asked a, a couple in the chat. How are you doing? Are you okay? Uh, yeah, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Very well, thank you. Yeah, what's your good question? Good to hear. Um, yeah, so Plastician, you went from mixing vinyl first and then going to CDJs, um, whereas myself, I started with like a controller and then to CDJs, and now I want to get into mixing on vinyl. Are there any tips that you'd have for someone doing it that way around? I would say... That's a, that's a great question as well, because I get this quite a bit at the moment. I think like people are buying vinyl again, They've got the collection that just stays on their shelf, they want to use it, right? So my main tip for that would be uh, maybe even like cover up this part of the mixer. Uh, anything that gives you visual cues, because you don't get that with vinyl, the, the most visual it gets with vinyl is once you look at the grooves of the record, which you can't really see in the dark anyway, you can kind of see where the breakdowns might be, but it's that you don't really look at that, right? So I would say try and get used to not looking at waveforms. Maybe load um, some tracks onto USB, but don't put them in record box, just put them in a folder. Um, so then you don't have like the BPM info, all that kind of stuff that you get once you put it through record box. That way you're like, then you have to listen to the beat and like kind of like know in your head, it's this speed. You need to kind of get that one to the same sort of speed by listening and yet when you're happy it's at the same speed, bring it back mix and then when you when you get to your vinyl you will already be in that habit of like using your ears instead of your eyes and using like all the tech to like help guide you um, which like it's mad but it does like for me someone who learned on vinyl but use cdjs a lot more now if i do go back to vinyl it's amazing how weird it feels because you get so used to looking at all these things um and the way that you kind of touch vinyl as well so like i definitely say like use use the vinyl mode on CDJs and try and get used to like touching the platter a little bit and messing about with the pitch to, because that's what you'll do when you're on vinyl. Cool, okay. Cheers, man. Um, just, thank you for the question, Dovsha. I'm just conscious of the time, so we've got two questions uh, before plasticians make. So your biggest challenge, okay. Staying uh, relevant without kind of like selling out, I think, you know, if you've got trying to be true to like the music that really excites you. And also I think it's another thing is that as you get older, like my music ta taste does change over time. And you know, like you get new influences, it's easy for people to look at you and go, oh, you're jumping on this, so you're jumping on that. But you know, if you're really into music and you're into like the movement and the way that it moves and you wanna try and like bring something new to the plate, maybe like you take some of those old influences and mix them with stuff that's new. 
and then maybe like you find producers that bridge the gaps between the things that you're trying to play so that your set sounds coherent instead of like, here's some old stuff, here's some new stuff. Like that, that is um, probably the biggest challenge for me is like my t music taste changes so much over the time that I've been DJing, but I want to try and can like, I think of like my career as like an enormous long DJ set. It's like, how do all of these things fit into a set that kind of makes sense? So I'd say that's the challenge for me is like, how do I bring all this music that I'm really interested in into a DJ set without making it sound like a jumble sale of everything? Because I listen to so much music, but not all of it works together in the same set. So it's about trying to figure out what works, how you present it. And yeah, I'd say that's, that's probably the biggest challenge for me. Okay, cool. Interesting. Uh, tips for playing your first gigs in front of an audience by Daniel Griffiths. Um, don't get too drunk. <laughs> um, make bring your own headphones. That's one thing I think on some of my early gigs, I just like didn't know you brought your own headphones and stuff like that. So like bring your own headphones. Make sure you've got like a backup USB as well, like because you never know you get there, lose one on the way. That happens, right? So have have backups. Me, I use Serato and I have backups on USB. So if I get there and my laptop's dead or something don't work or for some reason the cables break or something like that, I've, I can still DJ. It might not be quite as expansive, but I can play a good set. Um, so yeah, have a backup, have your headphones, um, and try not to panic too much. So long as like the music's good, people are gonna enjoy themselves, right? Don't focus too much on like being super technical. So long as you keep people dancing, that's, that's the most important thing. Okay, just a few more questions and then uh, we'll... How'd you go about getting your first gig, Claudia? I think like my first gigs, I guess, were putting myself like back back in the day. It was like being on pirate radio and the radio station putting raves on. So you know, if you watch Corrupt FM, it, that was my life basically. <laughs> uh, that that was actually my life. But um, I'd say like nowadays, maybe like if if you're into like niche genres or you have a very specific style of music you like, and you go to raves and you maybe get you see the promoter on the door, or you meet some people, or you meet the, or you can message the DJ or the promoter. Try and like meet them face to face at the venue because like as someone who does promote as well, I really like it when someone comes up to me and is like, oh, I, I really love to play your night. You get that all the time in DMs. Oh, can I play your night? It's not the same as someone coming up to you at the gig and saying, I'd love to play here one day. Can I send you a mix? And then next day you get mixed from anything. That's cool. Like, a person came out to support the night. I'd love to like help them out with a gig. So. I, I, I'm sure that this probably goes for a lot of other promoters as well. It's like that is really, you appreciate that because mm. you just need bodies in the dance, you need people who like what you're doing. Yeah. So if you like a promotion or a club night and you can meet the promoter at one of these smaller nights, go down, introduce yourself, tell them you're a DJ, send them a mix the next day, they'll remember you. Definitely will remember that they met you the night before. So that would be my best best advice. That's good advice. Okay, we're gonna close with two questions. We're gonna leave first, that was the first question. Then. Gene Gurney, we're going to come to you and then we'll close. So invest in equipment or rely on studios like Pirate? Mm. Do you know what? I said this because I worked with Pirate and um, I said to them, I worked out that I'd bought this kit for myself at the time and Pirate didn't exist when I bought my kit and it would have cost me something like the equivalent of three years of going to Pirate for two hours a week every week to pay it off. So it's like if I had access to a studio like Pirate when I needed this setup at home, I probably wouldn't have bought it because this setup costs about eight thousand pounds. It's like yeah, it's, not cheap. it's really expensive. Um, but if you've got it at home, you know, like this is probably what you're going to play on when you go to any club. So it's really good that you can get to grips with this stuff at Pirate Studios. And yeah, I think if I had access to the studios like that back when I had to buy them, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't have bought them. No, I'd have just gone there every couple of weeks, done my radio shows there, as a lot of people do now. I'm sure, you know. As I'm sure there are people here that, that use the spaces a lot. Yeah. For the price, it's like, you know, years to pay it off. So still. Uh, Jean Gurney, president, I'm sure I saw the hand up. Have you got a question? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. Okay. Well, so once again, thank you, uh, everyone, for attending. Uh, it's been another amazing live session. I hope to see some of your faces on more sessions. Uh, in the future. Just another reminder from the Virtuoso side, we've recently dropped production courses from Shura, Hodge, 
Uh, more recently, we've done DJ courses with Saoirse Archie Hamilton, plus a very special course with one of the most exciting DJs who's exploded on the scene uh, following a very infamous boiler room set, Sherelle. That's just literally dropped uh, today, I believe. Break the boundaries. Plastician does have a course with us too, Beats for Bars, quality course on making beats for MCs. Uh, Still Bangles has been in the building today as well. Keep an eye out for that. Toddler T was in last week. Melody was in uh, the week before. All keep your eyes on these. Just about the activity in here, we've got a huge, huge six-week live course starting June 29th, covering crucial areas of the music industry for emerging artists with guests from Resident Advisor, Warp Records, Hospital Records, Deep Medi, Boiler Room, Fabric, Butters. We've got Elijah coming in. Uh, we've got loads more coming in as well. Plasticians also joining us for that to talk on NFT blockchain. I'll leave it there. I don't want to give too much away. Um, and for people watching us on YouTube, there's a link in the description to start your seven-day trial with us. There's also a link for Pirates uh, as well for to book sessions. I'm gonna I'm gonna get out of the way. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you to it. And it's gonna 10 minute mini mix first edition. Thank you all. Shall I turn my mic off just in case my yeah, point so. goes a bit low? <laughs> but thank, <laughs> thank thanks you, everyone. everyone. I'm thank you. My mic. Uh, yeah, it's been great, and it's really nice to see Ooh. some faces as well, even in this like virtual setting. So. Thanks for sticking around. Hope you enjoy the music for the next few minutes.
Shutting up, 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 shutting up,
Yes. Thank you, first edition. And thank you, everyone, once again. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.